Hey, I hope everybody's doing well, you're healthy, you're sane. So last week I had the privilege of being joined by two brilliant minds, Dan Garraway, co-founder of Wirewax, and Devin Emery, head of growth at Curiosity Stream. My name is Kirby Grinds, founder of 4320, and this is the Streaming Wars. You're back in Brooklyn. I'm certainly keeping up with the beard. Uh, I, it's getting to the point where it's slightly scraggly. The hair is slightly scraggly. I'm sort of, I, I guess, in a Benjamin Button way, regressing into my, into my youth. Yeah, I'd like to. Um, has anybody tried self-administered haircuts yet, Evan? I knew you were thinking about it. I'm, I'm getting to that point, but, uh, but no. You can see that there's a little bit of a uh, weird swoopiness going on that is not really my normal style. But you know, right now it's still okay. But I think within a few weeks, if I'm still in my apartment, I might just go, you know, full off. I don't know. Mm, not sure about the full off. It's, it's quite yeah. overwhelming, isn't it? <laughs> How are you doing that, by the way, Kirby? Because your hair is still absolutely on point. Um, it's a, it's all right. Like if you look close, it's um. It's a um, little, little spotty, but uh, I'm just doing it myself. It's, it's tough. Like I'm doing, I'm um, doing my own haircuts. I'm, uh, I mean, I cook. I cook all the time, but I'm doing all my meals, all my drinks. I fixed uh, the water pump on my sprinkler system. Uh, I'm dealing with electricity on this um, landscaping thing. I, I'm doing all the. I can't wait to delegate these responsibilities to who they normally give it to. <laughs> but for a guy with way too many hobbies, which is myself, I think is a Gemini thing, it's kind of been awesome to be able to dabble in all these little things. Ooh, yeah, I get that. So Devin, you've been with QRC Stream for two or three months? Um, I think it's close to six now. Joined oh, wow. in about mid-November. What I was interested to know is like, you do have a pretty intense commute going back and forth between New York and DC. And so I'd imagine though, it is nice not to have to do that on the one hand, but the other hand, stuck at home. Yeah, well, it, it's funny. So on a on a day-to-day -day basis, it's actually pretty good because my apartment down there is uh, adjacent to the office. That's so like 45 seconds. But, you know, each week I am going up and down um, from, from New York to DC. So that is, that's certainly uh, a lot of traveling. So it is, it was a, um, very stark difference when I stopped going down there. Because um, the thing was, you know, we didn't know that it was gonna happen. So it was kind of just one week, we didn't go down because everything was shutting down. Um, and then I've been basically in my apartment for, I honestly don't know if it's been four weeks or seven weeks or anywhere in between. <laughs> I think it's six weeks, but again, I'm, I'm not sure either. Mm -mm. No idea. <laughs> so Devin, why don't you just do a quick overview of Curiosity Stream? Um, so Curiosity Stream, at least in the U.S., is primarily known as a subscription video on demand service, which is the primary way that we, you know, people get our content um, in North America. But you know, the the core of what we do is we're a factual entertainment service, right? So we distribute our content through direct uh, subscription um, to people who are either paying us directly or through uh, channels like the Roku channel, Amazon Prime channel. We have distributor relationships all over the world. So we do run linear cable networks um, in a lot of places around the world, like in uh, Africa through DSTV, um, Star Hub in Singapore, and we have a lot of other distributor relationships. Um, and then we also, you know, in, in the US, we have a relationship with Altice USA, where they bought a subscription for everyone who is a Suddenlink or Optimum subscriber. And so people are able to get our content through their VOD system. Um, we do something really cool, which is called IP waitlisting. So people who have an Optimum or Suddenlink internet connection can just automatically get access to our content. So the way that we view ourselves is, you know, we are a factual entertainment solution. Um, and it's kind of our responsibility to have our content be available in the easiest, best way that people get their content, right? So whether that's building their own bundles via Amazon and Roku channel, subscribing directly through distributor partnerships, we're kind of focused on all of that um, and, you know, in a way that makes sense for the business. Um, but, you know, we're producing, we're acquiring, we're building out our library. So that's really the, the core of it. And just curious on the IP whitelist thing, if I'm on Suddenlink and I go to a Curiosity Stream app, does it automatically detect my internet service provider and let me in? Or is there a process of, of hooking that up? Yeah, you'll set up an account, but it'll automatically detect that you're on that, so you won't have to pay. So there, we do we work with them um, to to market to their subscribers that they have access to this. And so a lot of people have come in specifically because they know they have free access. But we also market ourselves, you know, everywhere, right? So plenty of people are coming in because they see an ad for Curiosity Stream, and then being pleasantly surprised as they go through the flow 
um, that they're not they don't have to pay because they're getting free access but they still do set up an account so that they can access the uh, you know our website our apps all that so crazy times um, six seven weeks four weeks who, who knows what we're at at this point and who knows how long this is going to last we've read about ever pretty much every streaming service seeing gains whether it's subscriber gains viewership gains all of the above netflix disney plus hbo now and twitch but uh, devin i was wondering if you can talk about um the growth curiosity stream has seen in these uh, x amount of weeks of quarantine and stay at home yeah absolutely so pre-quarantine to where we are now we've seen the increase in engagement of about 100 percent um and we're measuring that basically on program views um, but it's you know across the board watch time um pretty much all of our metrics are up by um, about a hundred percent um so you know people who were subscribed to curiosity stream are watching a lot more curiosity stream but as you're indicating you know we're also getting a lot of new subscribers um our best month ever for uh net ads to our direct service is going to be april um second best march um before that we were also you know, hit, uh, hitting kind of records because we, you know, as I've come in over the last six months, been focused a lot on you know, optimizing our acquisition strategy overall. Um, but as we were doing that, and then this happened, we were able to react very quickly. Um, and part of that is our stay in, stay curious promotion that we've been running since things, you know, kind of uh, uh, made it so everyone was spending more time indoors. So, you know, we've definitely seen huge appetite from existing customers as well as huge appetite from people who weren't subscribers yet who you know decided that they were looking for more content as they were spending more time indoors i want to ask a little more about the stay and stay curious campaign then the acquisition strategy in general but are you able to indicate any amount of subscriber growth in terms of numbers or percentages i probably don't want to do that just off the top of my head i don't have anything that's you know easy to uh to say right now but um I will say it's very significant. It's been very significant growth. Um, again, partially because of what we've been doing since the end of last year in terms of optimizing our overall acquisition strategy as well as retention. Um, but definitely a lot of it has to do with the dynamics around coronavirus. I mean, one of the, one of the big ones, um, one of the big things that happened was um, a ton of money came out of auctions for advertising networks, right? So retail pulled out, travel pulled out, everyone pulled out at the beginning. Um, since a lot of money has come back in from you know, streaming services, from gaming companies, that sort of thing. Um, but we didn't, right? So again, as I was talking about the acquisition and kind of our, you know, strategic view on being nimble in acquisition, we very quickly, you know, reacted to what was happening with Stay and Stay Curious. Um, and so we were investing into a, you know, ad marketing, um, you know, advertising networks, just marketing platforms that had so much money come out of it that it was very efficient to reach people at a time when people were like, well, I'm going to be stuck indoors for a while. What is there to watch? So, you know, that definitely had, you know, there's a lot of factors that went into it, but it definitely had a very major impact on you know, our ability to, to reach people and to, and to retain them. One of the things that it might be interesting to talk a bit about is how streaming services have responded, right? You see a lot of ungating, which I think is not really the best way to go about it. What we did was we, we you know, cut the price on our annual subscription. So, you know, we were already very excessively priced. Now we're extraordinarily excessively priced um, and you're getting an annual subscription so when people are back to normal hopefully within you know weeks maybe a month or something whatever it ends up being they're still gonna have curiosity stream they're still gonna have that relationship and they're gonna be an annual subscriber and ideally we can retain them versus if we had done something like ungating our entire library and making it free for an amount of time you're not really building that relationship which is something that some streamers did do and I think we'll end up you know looking back and being like that probably wasn't the right move the last numbers you guys put out, I mean, you guys were already crushing it. I think December is like 10.5 million subscribers. In January, something like 13 million. So imagine what X amount of percent of subscriber lift we're talking about. And and just to be clear, those numbers do include like distributor subscribers yep. and all that sort of stuff. It's all of our different subscriber lines. Um, our current public number is the 13.3, I think, million subscribers around the world. Um, but we do, you know, by the end of the year, expect that to be a significantly higher number. You guys both know I'm more concerned, especially with the direct subscriber line. It's just what my business is based on. Uh, but to your uh, stay and stay curious promotion, it, it appears that that's, that offer is only available via the website. Is that correct? That is correct. Which I, I like um, because that's establishing that direct line. You mentioned ungating content. And one thing I noticed with uh, the various uh, digital products you have, connected TV apps, mobile apps, website, is that 
if I'm on a Samsung, Roku, or Apple TV, I go to Curiosity Stream, I can browse the library, see what you have to offer, all the great content. If I come in on a mobile device or website, you're putting me right into the onboarding flow, which I'd imagine is intentional. Yeah, you are, you're able to get to our library from um, the website, but we, I mean, we've done a lot of testing on this and that is typically the way that works the best for us. We're continuing to do a lot of testing on it. Just, you know, we are optimizing our, our you know, our, our intake flow, um, you know, overall in a lot of different ways. But, you know, you can get to browse our library, but a lot of the messaging that we're doing even off platform gets across the value. Because again, we have, a, we have a very compelling price point for what we have, right? And a lot of the marketing that we're doing makes it very clear that the price that you're going to be paying us is a tremendous value. If so, if you're discovering us through that, right? If you're browsing uh, in a TV app or something along those lines, it might not be the exact same experience. You might not be there for the exact same reason. So what we're trying to do is make sure that every platform has the best experience for you know us and them. Um, and we are doing some work on making our overall, you know, if you sign up on a TV right now, we admit it's a little bit clunky, um, but we are working on kind of the standard, you know, go to the go to your TV and then you can complete most of the onboarding on your phone. Um, or your computer or something along those lines. But we do want to make sure that you can see the content because again, we have a great library. So as long as you you know the pricing is very compelling and you can see you know at least a, a fraction of our library just very quickly, it becomes a very compelling you know, um, purchase. I've tested with some clients exactly what you guys are doing and seeing just basically to give somebody a bunch of options or just send them through one path and that's the funnel, that's conversion. And being able to feed off a curiosity stream ad on, on mobile web or, or just regular web, I mean, they're coming to the Curiosity Stream site and it makes sense to have one path from that. Otherwise, it could be um, a not great best use of that advertising dollar spent. When yeah. they can look around and just get lost and ooh, squirrel, do something else, close the browser. Across the board, all the sectors you mentioned are not spending on advertising like they were when completely wreck havoc on, on that, which is good for those still advertising to get the cheaper CPMs. I think the latest number I saw, which could be a lot higher, I wouldn't be surprised, is, is the streaming service sector, the ad spend was up 100 something percent, which I wouldn't be surprised if it's much more. But so have you guys been seeing, where have you guys been seeing like CPMs and are you investing more in advertising? So when it first started, CPMs were incredibly low. Everyone had pulled out. So even streamers, um, you know, uh, gaming companies, everyone who has now kind of come back in, they had pulled out too. Um, so we were seeing very, very low CPMs kind of across the board. Over the past month-ish, it's been ticking back up, right? I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to try to quote something I don't have the numbers on, but I think when Facebook reported, they said that their ad, you know, their ad revenue had kind of normalized by the end of April, where they're seeing that, you know, gaming companies, streaming companies, and all that sort of stuff had put enough, you know, kind of invested into this to replace a lot of what they had seen. So they aren't seeing growth, but they were seeing kind of stabilization year over year. Um, and that's, that, that jives with what we're seeing. So, you know, you also have Quibi who launched kind of in the middle of this, who has a ton of money to spend across all these networks. Um, HBO Max now has their launch date, so they've started spending. So you have, you know, a lot of, a lot of big guys. And then, you know, I'm very well versed in the streaming space and I've seen ads for streaming services that I had no idea existed, right? So like there are a lot of people now who weren't necessarily spending a lot in marketing who have decided that because of the current dynamics overall, it does make sense to invest in a way that they hadn't before. Yeah. So, you know, we've definitely seen, you know, again, extremely efficient as we first started, um, however many, six, seven weeks ago. Um, and it has been ticking back up, not to the point where um, it was previously, but getting closer and closer. There's still the other dynamic though of, you know, people are still stuck indoors. So even though the CPMs aren't as low as they were previously, you still have people who are going to be more prone to making a quick decision about getting a new streaming service that interests them. Um, although even that dynamic as we're, you know, opening up more and more is going to fade as well. So I think we're probably, you know, we're definitely past the peak, um, probably on the downhill of all of those dynamics, um, but there's still, you know, still stuff to be done. I had some experience a long time ago through my previous app development company, both uh, QRS Extreme's very first Roku app that I'm sure has evolved and changed a lot since then. Are you able to talk about what, like, how are you guys engineering that stuff? Is that all done in-house and what's, what's that makeup look like? Yeah, so we have a, you know, it's pretty small, but we have a pretty small engineering team. Um, it is bolstered by some freelance work um, and some relationships that we have to do work um, 
you know, overseas. Um, so that's able to increase our capacity, but we're building pretty much everything in-house. Uh, we are looking at, you know, how do we start adding in some third-party things that we don't necessarily have to build. Um, so we don't, if, you know, if it's not gonna either save us money and be as good um, or build enterprise value, then we don't need to build it ourselves, right? Um, but for the most part, our entire technology platform has been built and is managed uh, in-house. What about platforms where you see the most engagement? Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, iOS? Yeah, we are pretty well split. Um, what it what it typically seems like is the people who are discovering us on certain platforms then typically use those platforms more, right? So if they're coming in through iOS, they're more likely to use iOS more primarily. Um, I would say that you know we do see a lot of streaming TV. So we have uh, Roku as a massive platform for us. What it typically seems to follow is uh, device penetration, right? So we are everywhere. We are you know. We work very hard to be accessible on all devices. So what we see then is that we tend to follow just market share, right? In terms of people who have those devices will use us on those devices. Um, so we don't have any one platform that we are primarily on, but we do have pretty decent and significant percentages of viewership across all the platforms. Well, not all the platforms, there are some small ones, but the, the core platforms that you would expect. We'll soon be talking about things like Quibi, right? Uh, we yeah. are obviously interested in short form content. Curiosity Stream is in a very different space to that. How do you think um, you are positioned in the market? And is it really about content as far as you're concerned? And I would suggest is that, well, I would ask, is that in your mind a traditional content approach? The technology is just an um, implementation of getting that more traditional content to the market or do you think you guys are wanting to innovate with content in itself we mentioned earlier about things like netflix doing interactive content and people starting to think about how they could do things differently with the content itself quibi included what well, where do you guys stand on that kind of uh, thinking do you think? yeah we you know, we are definitely open to innovation in content. I think our view is that we don't need to be the company that basically uses technology for gimmick content. And I don't use gimmick as a you know, derogatory term in this, right? There are, when a new technology comes out that allows you to tell a story in a different way, um, gimmicks are very fun, right? And if you can do something that is not necessarily going to be the best way to tell that story, but it's a really cool new experience, I think that's really cool. And that's not really something that we would necessarily choose for ourselves. But as you know, the technology becomes more mature, then you start thinking about what content is better told in a certain medium, right? And so that's something that we definitely think about. Now, the boring example of what we're doing right now is we create content specifically meant for mobile consumption, right? Everyone does that. But you know, we have mobile distributor partnerships. We obviously have plenty of uh, viewership on mobile devices. So we want to make sure that you know the technology is there to make it very easy to watch. But if you are looking for a specific you know length or type of content, um, because you are in a situation where you're using your mobile phone over the TV, that we have something for you as well. So you know right now we don't have any big plans to uh, to do anything kind of major in terms of investing a ton of resources into kind of content technology innovation. Although we we definitely want to use it as it makes sense to. You know we've done a little bit where we partnered with some of our production partners on um, like an AR app and that sort of thing um, with Dinosaur, it's very cool. But that's not something that I think we we think that is a near term major investment for us. And out of interest, those things that you've done with AR, how did they perform? Were they, were they more of a marketing play or were they about the audience in a sort of content form? It was much more of a marketing play around um, a series that we were releasing um, that was more traditional about dinosaurs. So we used it in terms of, you know, getting more buzz for the release of that content. Mm -hmm. Do you see, I mean, uh, do you see the progression of AR into it? Could you see a world where the AR is the core product, for example? Not in a replacement sense, but definitely in a, you know, it's in its own, it is a content type of its own that gets um, solid usage, yes. I mean, I think that, you know, AR has already gone mainstream, right? Look at Snapchat, it's, you know, probably one of the, it's, it's kind of an AR company in some ways, right? They call themselves a camera company. A lot of ways that what they've done really well is integrate AR in a way that doesn't really feel like it is you know, what I was saying before, it's not really a gimmick. It is a gimmick in some ways, but it's kind of, it's, it's a core functionality that they've been able to build. So I do see that as more and more of that 
but I don't see that, you know, AR I don't think is going to replace traditional because a lot of times AR is more focused on interactive and that is something that people want, but it's not something that people want exclusively. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, then, you know, that could be a good argument towards Quibi, right? There's a diversity of creative outlets and a diversity of innovation and content that could be serving different audiences at different times. TikTok is also another sort of platform in that ilk that um, has extremely creative tool sets for producing content. What, what's your take on something like Quibi? Is, is, have you got any conclusions from both a personal standpoint, but also perhaps a, a competitive standpoint? I don't, I don't really see Quibi competing directly with Curiosity Stream. You know, I think that that it might be something where it made sense to partner with them. You know, and, and we produce content, all that sort of thing. You know, I think just overall on Quibi, you know, I think that in the in their current imagining, it will be very difficult for them. But you know, you can't really write out the pivot, right? They're very well funded. They have you know great talent, um, and I think that they need to figure out what niche they're filling because the niche that they thought they're filling, you know, I've said this before doesn't in in my opinion doesn't really exist right i think it's a it's the same general bet that go 90 was and it's kind of a misinterpretation of user behavior that said that doesn't spell doom for quibi right again there's a lot that as you were saying there's a lot that they can do that isn't necessarily going to be a direct representation of what they thought they were going to do when they launched but they could build into something that users really do want so they have you know solid platform and engineering team they have good technology right they have a lot of money that they can spend on content so i think they have a lot of room to experiment they just have to be willing to experiment because again what they have right now i don't see being successful but a lot of things aren't successful before their first second third pivot mm -hmm. do you have a I, I personally have found that the thing that i do like about it other than the ux which you pointed to engineering teams strong a lot of them came from snapchat it seems to me there's some elements that really lend itself to that short form factor. Um, one being news. Uh, I, I actually think the news consumption, the ability to interact to get different parts of the story quickly as an interactive technology with WireX, we've always quite liked the idea of exploring news because the depth of a story um, is something that in a 24 seven news cycle with short bite sized news pieces is very much left uh, and of course you don't have to look too far into press briefings in governments these days to see how you know a topical moment of a, a press conference can actually make the headlines rather than the story itself those integrative integrated features which allow you to go into depth and perhaps a, a, they explore more interactivity in that area seem to be very easy wins i would suggest you know topical quick current content um that seems to be where they could differentiate themselves and win versus the you know content that really is you know studio scripts that have been adapted to a mobile form factor which is where i feel like they're not differentiated though i think they think they probably are um i don't i don't see that's the case because i see like you know netflix and other platforms and we all know very well allow you to download content and watch it on your mobile phone. So, you know, whether I pause or whether it ends, I don't really care I, as, a, as a viewer. But that news, that current content, what's happening today, that's that's where I think it differentiates itself. Do you agree, disagree? Do you have any other content you've seen on it, which is interesting? I think it could. The, the thing is, is that Twitter is very similar to that, right? So there, are, I, I think, I, I don't think they have a white space, but I don't think that that is going to, again, necessarily doom them, right? They just have to be willing to compete. So I agree, you know, the the major investment into studio type content meant for a mobile device, I think that's a misinterpretation of what the market wants. I don't think people want that to your point, right? People might want that content, but they don't necessarily need a specific platform or a specific, hey, this is, you know, something new to you. I agree with you, it's not, it's not new. Uh, and there's gonna a lot of competition for that. YouTube's competition. Um, TikTok's competition, right? Anything that other people will do on their phone is competition for that attention. And do people want to pay for another thing if they feel as though they're, you know, they have enough on their phone? That's that's challenging. They would have to make some significant changes to make what you're describing, I think, feasible and and, and workable. Because a lot of what people do around that type of content is talk about it, and it's not a particularly, you know, discussable platform right now. You know, I, I know they got a lot of. Um, they got, they got a lot of angry uh, mail about not being able to do screenshots, right? 
um, and how that was something that would like, you know, if you can't do screenshot, we can't talk about it. I don't think that's really their issue. I don't think that would be something that really drives a whole lot for them regardless. But it's, you know, I don't see any real conversation except for that one viral tweet again, you know, a while ago about that. It was a show about someone with a golden arm. Like I don't see a whole lot of conversation happening around their content right now. They would have to build a way to talk about their content in a way that's not happening right now. And it would have to happen, you know, a tremendous amount for kind of that topical right now content to work on their platform. So they would have, you know, again, I think that that would be an interesting way to go, but they're not as close to it, you know, to be able it's to a do jump. it. Yeah. 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 Kirby, what's your thoughts on the last few weeks? It's been a few weeks since we last spoke about this. We spoke about it on week one. Any any progression on, uh, on, on, on obviously, there's big metrics coming out now. Obviously, big metrics, inverted commas, about the, the downloads, of course, as they always do. But we haven't heard much other than that. What's your... One thing I want to point out to what Devin said is um, being able to uh, do a screenshot, not a big deal, and it's not. But man, if they had screenshots, it would give Twitter and just the press something else to talk about other than all the, all the quibbling about Quibi. Like, for example, you guys see, I didn't see this until this morning. Um, Quibi, and along with others, JetBlue, they gave away email addresses. I didn't see that. But the headline was Quibi, JetBlue, and others allegedly give away email addresses. And basically, people download the Quibi app and put in their email address. Uh, they receive a confirmation link. Once you click that link, those addresses were then made available to Google, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, making them susceptible to easy targeting by advertisers and being tracked by companies that study shopping behavior, according to a report on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I would have to look at details, but that's, that doesn't sound particularly nefarious, unless they're doing something very bizarre. That kind of sounds like they're just building a retargeting list. It's, it's so easy to attack Quibi now. And there's a lawsuit over the turnstile technology that they did definitely have meetings with this company. One, one Quibi show that I am hearing about is Memory Hole, which is allegedly stolen from uh, everything is terrible, and, and there's not a whole lot of great stuff coming out of Quibi. If they had the ability to take a screenshot of Punk or some other shows, it gives something somebody else to talk about. I think yeah. that's one of the really interesting things is that the people yeah. who are really talking about content are us and analysts and media reporters. And, you know, I've looked for it and I don't really see a whole lot of conversation about Quibi outside of those circles. Now, I see a ton of conversation about Quibi because obviously I'm paying attention to the circles I just mentioned, but there's not a whole lot of conversation about the content or about the platform outside of that, which is not a good thing. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. I agree with you. And the comments I do see are uh, in, in, in public platforms where you maybe see non-industry people talking like YouTube and other like comments on Instagram and other things like that. People are generally like, I want to see this show, but perhaps, but I'm not going to watch it on that platform. When is it coming to this platform? And because, of course, the, the consumer doesn't give a fuck about a platform per se most of the time. I've talked about this a number of times. I think there's a big, big risk for any OTT uh, uh, in the market today that the content is the hero, not the platform. And, uh, you know, they, if, if, if the, the shows are anything to go by, they're trying very hard and putting all the dollars into making the shows the heroes. And again, the same problem exists. I think they've got two years to hold exclusivity to these shows. But um, regardless, the audience is just saying, I don't know no to Quibi, but the show, oh, I'll have a look at it, you know? And that that's, you know, <laughs> I think the biggest problem for the ATT market right now, and I think that's why going back a step to where we're talking about content innovation, my take on this is, and Kirby and I have spoken about this before as well, is like, if you're not investing in content innovation, which is absolutely exclusive to you, which is why Netflix did it, I think it's going to become very difficult competitively in a very saturated market because the, the producer of the show can, um, which in the case of Netflix's ideal, uh, I suppose, reference point of Bandersnap, they cannot make that show with anyone else now because the tools are only available with Netflix. So there's an exclusivity built into the content ownership uh, partnership the relationship there is only going to happen there with them and consequently there's also a very exclusive relationship with the audience who cannot watch that content anywhere else so the show has uh, I suppose reduced its uh, ability to um, to take the leader uh, and, and fly with it and I think that's something they've missed out on Quibi as well but as you say the the, the, uh, the audience reaction is is scarce 
at the moment. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see it play out. And ultimately, as you've also pointed out, I mean, they've got tons and tons of money and backing. Uh, I, I think that will eventually play into the, the outcomes. Yeah. But Dan, they're hearing three million download, app downloads. So I would I would love to address that, Kirby. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. That could be good and it could mean absolutely nothing. And that's the problem with using an ancillary metric as a success metric, right? So yes, you have to have installed Quibi in order to be an active user on Quibi. But you can also install Quibi and never have logged into it, right? And so they're spending seemingly all of their money right now on CPI campaigns, cost per install acquisition campaigns. And as you guys probably know, you can optimize those terribly to get very inexpensive installs for very in, not valuable at all users, right? So they like it, that's not a bad number, but it's also not a good number. And I think that you know, in order for anyone to get an idea of how is Quibi doing, you can't really pay attention to that at all. Because if you have a, um, you know, it, it's all the equation, right? So if you have a very small percentage of a very large number activating, that's bad. If you have a large percentage of a smaller number activating, that's good. But because there's no context there, it does make me worry a little bit that, you know, that number is not actually a success metric and they're reporting out on kind of an ancillary puff metric because, you know, it's not necessarily as good as they want it to sound. Yeah. I hate every time I hear the app download metric in the press. Yep. Or, or video views back when Facebook was giving everyone 3 trillion video views, right? Like you have to, you know, everyone who wants to analyze this stuff just has to understand that, you know, don't look look past what you're being given if you want to get an idea of what's actually happening. Pretty much it's Quibi. I don't know if Quibi news will ever, I think it'll be a while um, before we start not hear about that. It's just kind of the easy service to pick on, I guess. A lot of stuff about the movie theater um, studios and ex exhibitors, which we can chat about. The other thing going on, to me it's not news, but uh, I would love, Devin, your take on this. So two times this week, Warner Media put out um, releases. One is HBO Max is partnered to be available on Apple devices and part of the TV app. And then a couple of days later, they're going to be on Android devices. And so I would expect to hear Roku's available, Amazon's available. Do you think they, they're doing that to create leverage? Like, what would you think, what do you think the strategy is with that? Um... So my speculation is that they're announcing them basically as the deals are getting done and they didn't have the deals done for a lot of this stuff up until very recently. Um, Cause all these are, these are gonna be complex negotiations, right? Like if you are a Warner Media, then you can negotiate with these companies. Most people can't, right? And you're accepting standard terms, but most of these companies don't wanna do anything that's not relatively standard or at least very similar to what they've done with other companies of that size. So yeah, I think that there is part of that, but I think also part of it is that they're announcing these things as they are, as they're happening and they're, coming a little bit down to the wire in terms of yeah. uh, getting this stuff ready, right? Like I don't, my guess is that it's not a technical issue at all. They probably have all the platforms ready to go right now. Um, but it is, you know, all of these companies are platform companies. Platform companies make their money by taking some of everything, right? And big companies who are content companies want to make that sum of everything as little as possible. So my guess is that that's probably what's happening. The more that they get, the more leverage they are gonna have. So I think that you probably will see more kind of start water falling right now because they don't wanna be the last one. I was asked yesterday, who's next, Rick or Amazon? I think there's so much business between Warner Media and Amazon that just just makes that the last one to, to fall into place. Yeah, I don't know the last public number that was put out was something of anywhere between 50 to 70% of, of OTT HBO business was fueled by Amazon Prime Videos. Now is a good chance for Warner Media to restructure that create more balance of power with a direct line or spread it out. I mean, you definitely don't want to put all your eggs in, in one basket, one, one basket being Amazon. So that's a good opportunity for Warner Media, whether they take it or not. Yeah, I see of the two Roku happening and being announced next. Yep. You guys want to do a quick take on movie theaters and um, short of rhyming words, we got like a rap battle heating up. Right when this pandemic hit, Universal put out a few movies, uh, one of which was Invisible Man. I did see and vouch for watch it if you haven't things change, theaters shut down, they switch to make those available early for uh, transactional. So with this new Troll sequel, makes straight up said, we're not delaying this, we're, we put it out straight to um, digital rental. I think in three weeks, they've generated more net revenue than the whole previous Trolls movie did. And it's domestic um, exhibitor release in 2016. See, I don't even know what Trolls is, but um, a lot of people do. <laughs> In response to that, AMC Theaters and now Regal Theaters have basically said, 
We're not showing your stuff, Universal, and any theaters that want to do something similar, which I think is interesting because Warner Brothers is, have said they're sending Scoop straight to digital in the home uh, when it launches. What do you guys think about that? First of all, movie theaters were struggling before the pandemic. I was going to say, right? Time to ruffle any of my studio partner's feathers AMC and Cineworld, which owns Regal, um, they've spent like hundreds of millions of dollars a year over the past several years to renovate all of their theaters, right? So a lot of their locations, they do have alcohol, they do have, you know, much better seats than they used to. Um, they have IMAX theaters, they have Dolby Cinemas, um, you know, AMC was a lead investor in Dreamscape VR. So, you know, look, they are, they are looking to innovate, but at the end of the day, a lot of their locations, you know, are still kind of that old school view of it. But that's that's a very simplistic, I think, idea of what movie theaters are trying to be, right? So there's kind of a view that movie theaters want to be stuck in the past, and I, didn't, I don't really subscribe to that. Um, the the trolls issue is very interesting, and it's a far more nuanced situation than a lot of people who are reporting about it or talking about it necessarily know, right? So Universal has always been the studio that has been kind of like pushing and pushing and like towing the line and really wanting to be like, we want to do whatever we want to do, right? So. There have been movies that have been pulled by other studios to go direct to streaming, but the key difference is that they were all talking with the theater owners, right? Universal made a unilateral decision on that one. And that was still, you know, theater owners did not like that, but they still didn't do really anything about it, right? They said, you know, we don't like this. That's not something that we, you know, think you should have done unilaterally, but we get it. The tipping point was when in the Wall Street Journal article, they were quoted as saying, you know, now we are going to decide that we're going to release, you know, essentially day and date on uh, VOD as well as theaters. And the theater owner said, no, you don't get to choose what goes out in the theaters, right? So, you know, that letter, if you read it all the way through, doesn't say that they're not going to play universal movies, right? It doesn't say that, you know, this is now a lifetime ban. What it says is, if you do that, we're not going to license your films. If you decide that unilaterally you are going to release on VOD, then you don't get to choose that you're going to re release theatrically. Um, and what we saw was within about an hour or two hours of that, Universal had backtracked, right? So we had seen previously to that, Warner Media had, had, had said something, um, it was either on an investor call or in an article, that kind of sounded similar to what they were saying, but they on their own immediately backtracked, right? So it's a weird dynamic where studios get a lot of benefit from theaters but because they work with theaters there are going to be some restrictions on their business because that they work with theaters that they don't necessarily want right so this is a carriage dispute you know this is basically a you know content provider saying we want to do this you know the distributor the theater saying you know this is this would be a bad thing for our business if you're going to do this then we can't have a business relationship you know, I don't, I don't think that it's being presented with as much subtlety and nuance as it actually is. And the reality is, theaters are still making billions and billions of dollars for studio. I think it's a 40 billion global industry right now, right? So I think there's a bit of mischaracterization around all of this stuff. I think if you read through the letter and you read through, you know, Universal's response, you'll see that this is not something where theater owners are saying Universal is out of theatrical exhibition. That's not what they want. And neither side thinks that that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a contract negotiation. And there will probably be changes to theatrical exhibition over the next few years, which is why the rhetoric is going to be public, right? It's the same thing if, you know, Dish drops Viacom for three weeks because they're going to do a contract negotiation and things are going to change. And the idea is that each company wants to have leverage going into those negotiations. You know, I think that you'll definitely see theaters that are old and run down and, you know, not necessarily the best experience, but they've been investing a ton of money. You can see, like, you know, you, you look at some of the reports, they've invested might be billions of dollars into upgrading the experience. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not stuck in the past, but they are locations, right? So the way that I view this is it's not, movie theaters versus studios really right it's kind of experiential entertainment built around the film industry versus direct to home but what you see is a lot of people who are really focused in on that direct to consumer is the best and only route narrative fail to realize that having that windowing strategy is actually better so to go with the trolls example you know take universal's numbers with a grain of salt that you want knowing that they're doing the same thing amc is doing and trying to get their leveraging position right but that is you know, typically they would go to theaters, they would make their hundreds of million dollars in theaters, they would go to sale and rental, and they'd make their, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever it is there, and then they go streaming. What they did with Trolls, though, is that during a time when every entertainment company is seeing 100% increases, you know, they are seeing that same thing. Now, it was the first one to do it, so they don't really have anything to, to base it on. 
but they're seeing a massive boost in engagement because people are home and it gets a whole lot of press for doing what they did, right? But now they don't have a secondary transactional market. So they got that, that's, that's their money for this, right? And then they can go put it on a streaming service. But to say that what they did in the first three weeks is representative of the amount of money that they would have done in a traditional rollout is not an accurate view of things. So, you know, there's, this is a really, as you can probably tell, this is a really fascinating area to me. Um, and I think that it's one that, you know, we'll see kind of play out, but the real, the real change and the real innovation is going to be happening much more quietly than the headlines are going to indicate. That's really interesting. And, uh, and, and, and a very detailed perspective, because I think you, you know, that, that letter of what's going on beneath the surface is certainly not obvious on those headlines. And I, I, I think it goes my mind what your thoughts are about theatres generally, because those two theatre companies that Chloe mentioned, AMC theatres and legal, are the only ones that I have been to which have not been upgraded actually in New York anyway. I found that those are, those are very traditional theatres. And the, 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 the new experiences are tending to come from more independent, smaller groups. Um, who perhaps have more control and um, you know are starting from scratch versus trying to you know renovate old theaters. What is the opportunity for the for the, for, for innovation in that in that area? Do you think? But I had a theater company reach out to us talking um, an independent uh, group that they had quite a number though, perhaps in the hundreds of theaters. They were um, really trying to think about how to innovate with the experience beyond what I just mentioned, which is alcohol and things that are. Uh, or independent theatre uh, things, relaxing chairs, all that sort of stuff. They were actually trying to innovate with lighting that complements what's going on in the, in the actual film. They were trying to experiment with different sort of, I suppose, if you help your, your mind back to those sort of 4D cinemas, you know, those elements that could be actually even more experiential to the, uh, to the theatre. Where do you think it, it, theatres could and should innovate? Look, I think that what you're talking about is absolutely key to their business continuing to provide value, right? If if it is basically sitting in something that is less comfortable than your living room that with sticky floors, then they're not providing any value, right? So what? how can they make that experience better? Part of it is having the big screens, like the massive IMAX and Dolby Cinema and, and that sort of thing. I think part of it is also, what I briefly touched on is, you know, how can they use their space and potentially with studios and potentially with other content providers, make more out of home experiential entertainment, which is what a, a good movie theater should be, an out of home experiential entertainment experience, not just going to watch a movie somewhere, right? I think that is, something that is becoming more and more something of the past so there's obviously you know the seating that they've uh that they've invested into the screen stuff that they've invested into and then i think they do need to look at content innovation right they should continue to you know work with the studios obviously they they have to that they wouldn't have a business if they didn't but they should look at what other things can their you know can their technology provide that isn't necessarily just that experience um yeah, I don't have a whole lot of information about the the Dreamscape VR thing, but it's, you know, I read a little bit about it and it seems really cool. You're using that space and you're using that technology to do a very immersive um, experience, right? And, you know, as technology gets better in the living room, how do you make that experience of watching a movie feel different to the point that, you know, it's not, you don't, you don't want to just wait for the rental window, right? And I think that's the, the theater owner's responsibility. Um, something that, again, they're working on, but it's very difficult when you have that number of locations to invest enough to do that across the board. So how do they do that strategically? And how do they make sure that they are providing that for an audience so that studios you know, are going to continue to get that benefit of the billions of dollars coming through that system versus, again, just showing a movie on a screen? When theaters open back up, are people gonna go? Are people gonna I, be scared to be close to others? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people in the entertainment space view it through kind of the movie theater lens to an extent that it doesn't really make sense to, right? I would say if people are going to restaurants, people are going on the subway, people are going about that, then yes. If they don't, then no. But, you know, as we as we can all see, there's plenty of people out there who, you know, won't stay home right now, right? So, you know, the, the idea that people are not going to go out after the authorities say that you can is that's not true the extent is going to be where all this is made or broken, right? To what percentage do people change their, you know, kind of immediately following this um, behavior? And my guess is that it is going to, it, it will be, people will go to movie theaters, I think, right? Especially if we're talking about the ones that have, you know, there, there's some that have a lot of space between seats. I think they will have to 
take seats in between parties and groups and that sort of thing. So, you know, if it was something, again, like one of those dingy, sticky floor, everyone is shoulder to shoulder theaters, I think that'll be a much harder sell unless you're in an area where people are trying to go out right now anyway, um, than something where, you know, it's you and your party separated by, you know, in a lot of cases it would be six feet, then I think people would probably do it. But again, you know, the answer for movie theaters is going to follow the answer for everything else.